Hello, everyone. Uh, why don't we get going? We have a large number of panelists today, so I want to give everyone a chance to speak. Uh, just for some quick introductory remor remarks, uh, welcome everyone to coming to this. Uh, very good attendance here. There's another 60 or so people, I believe, on a webinar, so definitely a topic of great interest currently. Um, I'm Gabriel Stern. I am this year's chair of the Toronto Computer Lawyers Group, uh, one of the three hosts of today's event. Uh, we are co-hosting this along with uh, Denton, who provided the room, the food, et cetera, and uh, LexisNexis Canada, specifically the Lexis Practice Advisor Team. Uh, so thank you to everyone who's helped put this event together. Uh, just a few quick words about the uh, TCLG, Toronto Computers Lawyers Group. Most of you are probably aware of who we are. If you're not, uh, we're a group of local technology lawyers. Uh, we host events like this every month or so. We're currently in the process of setting up our second event for the year, so we'll be sending out a broadcast about that uh, once the details are finalized. So, again, welcome everyone. Uh, once we get to the talk, there'll be a bit more details, I think, about the procedure for it. I think we're going to try to hold questions till the and given that we have the webinar participants as well as a large number of folks in the room, but I will let the moderator speak to that on more details. Um, in terms of who we have speaking today, again, a, a well-versed panel on all these uh, issues. First off, we have Timothy Banks, uh, who is the Canadian lead for Denton's Canada Privacy and Security Practice. His practice also includes assisting Canada clients in navigating Canadian laws relating to consumer protection. Uh, he blogs on privacy and security issues, and he leads Denton's Toronto Research Group and is also the co-chair of the firm's Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Uh, next, we have Julie Chapman, I believe at the end. Uh, she heads the Canadian legal department of LexisNexis, advising senior executives on a broad range of legal matters, including commercial contracts, M&As, employment law, and regulatory compliance. In 2016, she received a certified in-house counsel designation awarded by the Canadian Corporate Counsel Association and the Rotman School of Management, University of Toronto. Uh, next, we have Aliyah Ramji. She's the Director of Business Strategy and Legal at Figure One. Uh, Figure One was labeled as one of Canada's 11 tech companies to watch in 2016. Uh, she has spent time lobbying the U.S. Senate and Canadian government, making submissions on international free trade agreements and taking companies global. She also teaches the legal aspects of international business as well as business law at Ryerson University. Uh, next, we have Ron Ladadio, who has 20 years of leadership experience in IT. He's led large programs developing IT capability, achieving complex systems integration, and delivering significant transformational initiatives to boost business performance. Uh, Ron's last role at IBM was the Chief Technology Officer for Business Services in Canada and is now the Vice President of the Emerging Technologies Group at CGI. And finally, we have our moderator today, who is Sarah Dale Harris. Uh, she joined LexisNexis Canada in July 2016 as a Director of Content Large and Mid-Law. She is responsible for the strategic direction of the content plan for this segment and also has operational responsibility for lawyer team building and supervision and for maintaining the Lexis Practice Advisor Canada Practical Guidance Product, which I will say is a great product because I've contributed to the consumer protection section to it. So with that, I will turn it over to the uh, panelists. Make sure our mics are on. Can you hear me okay? Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today in the room and online. Um, in terms of the format, our panelists will have 10 minutes approximately for each of the seven topics uh, in the handout that's in front of you and online. I believe it's been emailed to you. If, uh, if you don't have a copy of the handout, though, we'd, happy, we'd be happy to email it to you. Um, on the flip side of the agenda, there are some resources that we thought might be useful. We can, again, email it to you if you'd prefer to have live links to download. So in the discussion today and the topics we're aiming to cover, uh, we looked at them within the context of the necessary dialogue between IT people and legal people. Uh, Ron and I worked together for a long time, and uh, he's been a superstar for me. Um, and so this is all with a view to being well-versed uh, to be able to future-proof our organizations and contracts. Oh, is that loud enough now? Um, this is going to be fast-paced, not unlike the changing legal landscape. So we're going to ask, as, as, the, as uh, Gabriel indicated, uh, for people to hold their questions until the end, and uh, we'll be happy to answer them. So imagine in your worst nightmare that 100,000 Canadians, 143 million Americans, and 400,000 citizens of the UK have had their data compromised in a security breach while on your watch. Then multiply that number by an average cost of about $255 per incident, 
and you've got an absolutely staggering bill. I think it's about $3.6 billion, if my math is correct. So do you point the finger internally to see which system failed and who fell asleep at the wheel? Do you blow the dust off your contracts and look for third-party providers to cover some of the costs? Do you have insurance policies in place? They are available these days uh, to cover a security breach or a data spill. Do you just open up your wallet, hire an excellent PR firm, and hope your business doesn't go down the drain? Do you roll up your sleeves and think ahead about the next when and not if, and get proactive with the right team of advisors at the table? All of the above? Some of the above? Run away? Now imagine you're the SEC and Edgar has been hacked, and it just goes on. Between the ever-changing legal landscape, the rights of individual customers to have a reasonable assurance of protection of their personal information, and the demands of everyday corporate survival in a competitive landscape, we do live in challenging times that require knowledge sharing, collaboration, and proactive practical solutions, which brings us to our discussion today. We've already gone through the list of people, but our panel is made up of key resources who manage risk from a variety of vantage points and who work to keep us off the front page of the paper. As indicated, Alias is Figure One, which is a company that operates an online forum in the medical imaging and diagnostic space to enable medical professionals to share anonymized information to help treat and diagnose patients and share expertise. Julie, as our in-house counsel at Lexis, um, you know, Lexis, among other things, sells online solutions and has an e-commerce site um, and is part of a publicly traded company. Ron is the CGI, which is a large consulting firm, as we know, with operations across multiple jurisdictions and in different sectors. And of course, Tim, who is a leading subject matter advisor in the area of privacy and data protection. So with that in mind, as part of the backdrop today, I'd like to dive into our first topic, which is the legislative framework. So with all the statutory regimes, domestic and foreign, that are in play, it's a bit like trying to play darts blindfolded. Companies negotiate hard over who's responsible for what, whatever the legislative regimes might be, in an effort to mitigate risk, not just financial, but also reputational. But this has become an increasingly costly and complex undertaking. So Tim is gonna spend a few minutes walking us through the key legislative regimes that we'll be considering today, how they operate, and give us a sense of how fast moving the law is because every one of these is currently in flux. You didn't know you were gonna get a privacy lecture, did you? <laughs> um, and you won't, because we, we don't have time for all of that. But what we do have time for is really to just sort of point out maybe some trends, right? So we see, we've got, um, as you're aware, PIPIDA, the Personal Information Protection Electronic Documents Act in Canada, under review with lots of people clamoring for it to be strengthened, um, to give the commissioner order-making power, maybe introduce some more fines in order to strengthen it and move it towards the EU. You have in the EU the General Data Protection Regulation passed and ready to come into force in May with very substantial uh, potentials for fines of 2 to 4% of, annu of global annual turnover and increasing stringency around some of the rules um, that have, uh, uh, have already, to some extent, been enforced in Europe for many years now. You have Castle here at home, um, uh, Canada's anti-spam legislation, much maligned and detested by the fact of life, probably not going away completely anytime soon, but under review. Um, and but we've also seen um, lots of active enforcement um, by the CRTC on that, and no hesitation to um, either issue administrative monetary penalties or um, Get, uh, get companies to agree to pay money um, as part of compliance agreements. And then finally, we have, of course, the Personal Health Information Protection Acts across the country, um, which uh, have been slowly evolving as well. The trend um, in, in all of that, though, that, that, that we're seeing is more and more adversarial framework between the regulator and the regulated, more, uh, more emphasis on documenting compliance, more emphasis on having to prove to an evidentiary standard that we would associate with a judicial proceeding that you have things like consent. And just last week, um, we see that the Office of the Privacy Commissioner in, uh, in Commissioner Terrian's annual report um, again, reiterating a message that he gave in May, um, but, but now um, making that uh, statement to, to Parliament, that he's going to embark on more commissioner-led investigations. And I think this is a little bit of a surprise for Canadians, 
um, involuntary audits of organizations. So the Office of the Privacy Commissioner already has very broad, expansive audit rights, has subpoena rights just like a Superior Court of Justice. Um, and the suggestion is that Commissioner Tarion may start using um, the audit powers, which have really laid dormant. There haven't really been um, many um, uh, audits except in connection with um, site visits in an investigation, such as um, with respect to Ashley Mad the Ashley Madison case. But now we may see um, a, a, a more active um, commission on that point. So um, with that kind of more adversarial approach, these issues are harder to make go away. They're becoming less soft law, things that you had done over in this little thing called the privacy office, and they would make the problem go away, maybe adjust the consent, um, you know, make friends with the, with the, with the commission staff. Um, now you really need an internal escalation path, um, particularly if there is this risk that either the sector as a whole will be investigated and audited, or you may end up with the OPC on your doorstep. So there have been a lot of discussions about the challenges um, with the consent framework, as I'm sure you've all faced. Um, and the question, I guess, is whether we need alternatives to it or whether we need to address the challenges within the framework, how we can do that. So you were you mentioned the OPC report and Castle being so consent driven, um, not to mention that other laws differ with respect to consent. So how are we going to be able to reconcile all those differences and yeah, do you have so, any recommendations? So that's a, re a really good um, point in that um, what we're we're also seeing is a move to a, a really in Canada anyway to a, a standard of consent that's informed consent, almost like in the medical model, having to really explain to people what it is that you're going to be doing and what the harms are and documenting um, documenting that and rec and having a record that you could you can prove um, that's um, maybe an unfortunate development because in Canada at least under our privacy laws we don't have some of the same exceptions that are available in Europe um, that but that trend when you're dealing with consent to have it expressed free and formed we see around the world we see it under the GDPR and um, it's, it's, it, it really isn't um, going away, and I think it, it, it is very challenging for everyone, um, and I'm sure particularly in, in, in practice when you're trying to get that consent. I, I think the trouble is going to be navigating all of the different jurisdictions, which is the biggest problem that we have. Every jurisdiction has their own informed consent laws, or at least with the GDPR will have their own informed consent laws. But... At the end of the day, um, how many of you actually read your Apple terms of service or privacy policy? I write them and I don't read them. Like there's, <laughs> most of you in this room have never read Apple's policy. In fact, when your iOS was updated last week, um, you pressed I agree three times and you, you have no idea what's in there. Um, but that, that makes it very challenging for people like me who are trying to get informed consent because how can consent really be informed when we're all we have to do is press the I agree button or scroll down? Um, so I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges is you can say there's informed consent, but there never really will be. Yeah, I think you do need to. So if you're future, future if you're looking to the future, I think like that's not going away. So how are you going to how are you going how are you going to deal with that? You need to have a record, and I think we need to increasingly think about having records that would uh, withstand evidentiary scrutiny. So do you have an audible, auditable record? Are you ever going to migrate that record to a new platform, to a new service? Probably. So are you, do you have controls in place that you're not going to lose it? I don't know how many of you advise in the castle area, but one of the most um, disheartening situations is where um, a marketing um, group migrates to a new platform and they lose all of the provenance of the consents because when they moved over the consents to the new platform, it, they all get coded as the date of the migration and the old database is gone. So now you don't have any auditable record. So building those processes, you need to think about these things from an information governance point of view, I think, if you are if you're if you're if you're planning for the future to make sure that you don't lose the evidence along the way. And, and you'll have the tick boxes or whatever that you'll put in into your consent forms. But when once you do lose that, once you do lose that, um, 
it's, it's really hard to build a system unless you're building it internally to do that. And I think we're going to have to look at outside service providers to help us with that because internally I can't build a send grid or a MailChimp um, for all the emails that we need to send every, every day. Yeah, I think we can get Julie to weigh in on that. Uh, she has embarked on some interesting processes to manage council compliance uh, within Lexus. So as a starting point for uh, I mean, I suspect most people in the room has an idea of what LexisNexis does. Um, when I'm in situations where I'm speaking to non-lawyers, people think that we sell cars. But um, <laughs> I assume you know what we do. And because our clients are primarily lawyers, um, legal professionals, they're well aware of Castle and Pepita and, and anything else. So we have to be, in my opinion, um, even more vigilant, um, making sure we're in compliance. So. Um, back, you know, however long it was now, three and a half years ago when we were told that CASEL was coming into force in the summer of 2014, um, we realized at the time that um, we were recording, you know, opt-outs, uh, opt-out requests on essentially an Excel spreadsheet, which I'm sure a lot of companies were doing, and realized that there was going to be a lot of work to be done um, moving forward to make sure that we were able to actually track um, track consent uh, and opt-in consent. So we did decide to go the route of developing something internally, um, and I worked closely with our IT department um, on that front. And uh, I think one of the I can I can speak generally about it, but one of the most important pieces was um, the realization early on from the executive uh, that we needed to put this in place. And uh, you know, part of the reason for that was the the high penalties potentially associated with breaching CASEL, but again, also, um, just given our industry, we needed to take it very seriously. Uh, so we did have that buy-in. We created essentially what we refer to internally as the CASEL tool, and um, what that, that does uh, is allow us to track um, the basis of our applied consents. As many of you know, you have to rely, or we re rely quite a bit on existing business relationships. And in order to do that, we have to be able to have a system um, which is set up that shows, you know, for example, we sell a lot of products on a subscription basis, um, so we need to be able to know when those uh, contracts are, are going to expire um, in order to see when an implied consent um, may potentially end. Uh, that all has to be tracked in the system. Uh, in order to do all of that, employees have to be trained. Um, and that's something that I provide on an ongoing basis, even now, you know, three years later. Um, CASEL training is part of the onboarding uh, training for all new employees. We have refresher training for anyone that's, that's potentially customer-facing or sending messages outside of the organization. Um, we even created, you know, like a little quiz that everyone has to fill out <laughs> and submit to HR. Uh, so we have those systems in place, and I can tell you, even with all that training and the emphasis on complying with CASEL, um, I, I get questions, usually fact-specific questions, from employees still on a, at least a weekly basis uh, because of the fact that, as we all know, the Act is quite complex um, and situations arise frequently where it's just you're just not sure. Um, and I'm happy to answer those questions. I'd much rather people ask than just assume. One, one thing, I guess, if you were if you were going to be sending, if you decided not to build it internally and 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 send something like that out for development, or you were relying on a marketing company to um, assist you, and this could apply not just to Castle but anything. I mean, uh, would you agree that maybe we need to up our game a little bit? We've 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 put in a lot of provisions in contracts about requiring the party to comply with law and keep records and um, you know, comply with council, maybe even some specific requirements. But we, I don't think many of us have um, put in our contract requirements obligations about how those records are going to be delivered back to us in a form and a manner that we can integrate into our own systems so that we can, um, we can always have the evidence that we may need if if the regulator comes calling. Uh, that seems like the next sort of evolution right. um, in, in what we need to do. Uh, I think that's a really good point, and what I find that I come up against, um, and I'm sure there are 
specific, you know, Canadian providers, um, you know, that do some of that marketing work where they're sending out emails. I find two things tend to occur, though, right now is one of them is that when, you know, marketing comes to me and they want to negotiate a contract uh, with a provider like this and I want to put some of the onus on them regarding CAFA compliance and audit, audit rights and things, they push back. They don't want to take that responsibility. They want to put it on us. So that's the one thing. And the other part of it is if the provider happens to be U.S.-based, then you're, you're going to get nowhere <laughs> pretty quickly because the, the laws are just so different in the U.S. This is a foreign concept that you would have to track this kind of this level of, of compliance. Uh, so I absolutely agree. Um, and so for now, I do carefully look at those situations, and I recommend that marketing, you know, they limit um, what they use third-party providers for. Um, so there are pretty strict parameters around that right now. And again, I think it's, it's because our company just really takes CASEL compliance very seriously. And as, as you know, as I've explained, we do have a system. Uh, but there are some things where we're sending out, you know, um, email blasts uh, to organizations where, you are, where we're working closely with a provider to manage that. But it hasn't been easy. Uh, I'm not as comfortable with it as I would be if we were just handling it ourselves. Um, so in terms of transacting, particularly across borders, uh, as you mentioned, you know, the laws are different in every jurisdiction. Um, but what if the, one of the parties is a corporation, not a crown corporation necessarily, but a public corporation that doesn't want its data to cross the borders um, and wants it to be stored exclusively locally. Um, so what do you do to avoid the U.S. Patriot Act? And, you know, is there such a thing as true local storage um, yeah. in this day and age? I think Ron will get Ron to weigh in on on this and the possibility of uh, a role for blockchain and all of this. Am I not close enough to the mic? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, do you want me to repeat what I just said? I'm just trying to move Julie into a conversation around corporations that want their data stored locally, not offshore, to try and avoid statutes like the U.S. Patriot Act, um, and whether there really is such a thing as local storage from a technology standpoint. Um, and we'll get Ron to weigh in after, but I'm interested in what Julie's thoughts are on uh, on dealing with foreign transactions. So, right. So. It is an issue, an ongoing issue, um, and uh, where we have certain clients, and you're right, uh, I mean, if we're going to talk about um, government clients, that's sort of a whole different animal. Um, but it, just focusing on, let's say, uh, law firm clients that may be concerned about um, having data, uh, whether it's their own data about their employees or data about their clients that may be stored in some of our systems, they're con concerned about where it sits um, or where, um, whether or not it even interacts with servers outside of Canada. Um, those are all issues that we're working through. And I've found, um, and I think Tim maybe can comment on this as well, that if you're dealing directly with, uh, you know, talking about data flowing into the U.S. and the concerns about the Patriot Act uh, come up, a lot of the concerns are not necessarily well founded uh, because you know if we're if we're honest about it, our governments share data uh, all the time, um, so that's unavoidable um, but so I wouldn't and and the OPC has also come out and said that they don't necessarily think that um, you know there's a uh, your data will be more vulnerable in the u s than it would be in Canada. Um, I think some changes have occurred recently that Tim's written about with respect to an executive order that Donald Trump revoked, um, which puts things, makes things a little less clear. Um, but for me, it's about trying to, to I guess, educate and, and explain to consumers that we will provide, you know, we still take responsibility for your data. We are providing a comparable, a comparable level of uh, protection if it does go cross-border, uh, but our privacy policy that no one reads <laughs> does cle clearly say that, um, you know, your data could leave the, the country. And the reason for that is 
although we are, you know, LexisNexis Canada here, I'm part of a huge global organization. Our parent company is based in London, um, and we have operations all around the world. So it's impossible to guarantee that everything that we have here will stay within Canada. And I suspect that's the case for most organizations. Yeah, well, mostly because uh, in today's environment, in IT environment, we're relying a lot on cloud-based services. Um, and cloud-based services really are very powerful. Like, for example, some organizations are really heavily dependent on things like Salesforce.com, which sits in the cloud, runs in the cloud. Um, but most organizations don't necessarily think twice about where that's sitting and what that's doing. And um, there's a lot of times in which organizations have what you probably akin to a data privacy officer. They'd be pretty um, adept at making sure there's governance and management models in place to make sure that these decisions are actually done well. But there's a lot of organizations that we deal with that don't necessarily think of this the first time. Um, and although they want to capitalize on some cloud services, they necessarily don't think about geofencing space or data um, and really making sure that there's a compliance mechanism in place. Because uh, the technology is there to control it, and there's technology decisions that can be made to make sure that you control that uh, data and where it sits. But the biggest problem is really the people process and figuring out, you know, the decisions that they make every day to, 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 in their use of the data. Um, so it's complicated, and it's not, not, not only just a conversation that our uh, council needs to have with the business about the requirements of their processes and what they need to do, but also, more importantly, with those that are, I think, probably physical custodians of the actual data and the decisions that they make about how they meet the needs of the business as they make the systems that hold the data real. Um, so I can argue both sides of, of, of this one. Um, but what I would say from the practical point of view is, um, you know, context is everything. And now that we have an, AW, an Amazon Web Services Canada region, you can go to Microsoft Azure and keep your data in Canada. And there are other providers, big providers, that offer your ability to localize your data in Canada. Does that open the door, I ask, to uh, a regulator like the OPC taking more um, notice of research that it paid for um, by some researchers uh, that I think I put on the, I offered up on the um, handout list about uh, maybe rethinking um, whether you can, you can not ignore, but not look very seriously at the legal environment in which the data is being put and focus mostly on the contractual provisions that you're putting in place to protect the data when it crosses borders? Do you have to pay attention to the legal environment in which that contract is going to be performed? Um, does, that give the, give, does that give privacy commissioners not the opportunity to say, no, you can't transfer it, but to put more restrictions on the ability to transfer it, maybe require heightened um, contractual clauses? I don't know, but I think stay tuned. I mean, again, with this pressure to drift towards the Europe, um, you could see uh, and, and this, this, this internal pressure, it's not an external pressure, internal pressure from Canadian regulators and privacy advocates to push the law more towards um, the European standard. Will we see more obstacles um, in place to transferring data across borders given that there are practical solutions to keeping data within Canada? I don't know. On the flip side, of course, we have the U.S. taking the lead on that charge um, in NAFTA negotiations, trying to get rid of or get Canada to promise not to put in um, restrictions on the cross-border flow of data, um, uh, attacking those laws that are there um, in British Columbia, Nova Scotia, and to some extent New Brunswick, um, and, um, and to ensure that no other ones pop up. If I were planning, though, if I were the organization and I were doing an, a risk assessment, one of the things that I'd probably want to understand is um, if the worst case scenario happened, um, can I move my data? Would I be able to extract it? Can I separate it? Could I switch regions overnight? Um, is there, you know, what, what, what is this going to do to my, to my business going forward? Because I don't think data localization laws are going to disappear altogether around the world. I think one of the things that we consider is um, whether the services we use or the third-party 
storage services we use have different uh, servers across the world that we could move our, our information to. So, for example, with AWS, with Amazon Web Services, we could bring our data back to Canada from the U.S. pretty quickly. But on the, on the note of NAFTA, and, and given that we don't think um, a lot of these data laws are, are going to disappear, the tech community, at least, if no, if no one else, is actually lobbying the government to have unified tech laws between Canada and the U.S. So we were just, um, our own company was at a round table last week and was on a call yesterday saying how do we, as NAFTA is pushing forward this week and next, how do we make sure that data can be moved across borders? So they are very much, the tech community is very much considering this around the world. So in terms of these global organizations, um, I worked with one that had clear policies and very sophisticated protocols um, and systems that were in place to report data breaches uh, and spills, uh, which were defined differently, um, which included internal reporting obligations and legal input and contract review. And so there were all manner of people, people who ended up getting involved in the process. Um, to manage it. As good as these are, of course, there's always the human component, and fear factor is certainly something that plays into it, no matter how sophisticated you are. Um, so I'm interested, Tim, were you surprised by the draft, um, sorry, the draft breach regulations under FIPIDA, and do you have any thoughts on? Yeah, just, just to get a sense, how many people are familiar with the data breach, the proposed data breach regulations, so I can level that? Okay, really? Not more? No? <laughs> Okay, so uh, so as you know, federally, the uh, uh, Digital Privacy Act enacted a federal data breach reporting um, obligation, reporting, notification, individual notification, and logging of data breaches for organizations, commercial organizations um, that are subject to um, subject to PIPIDA. Those provisions haven't come into force because they needed there needed to be some regulations. Um, uh, innovation, um, science, I can never remember the rest of their new title, former Industry Canada, has published um, the draft regulations. And the, in my perspective, um, I'd be interested in others on, on the panel, they're not as bad as I would might have feared. Um, for the most part, they track um, the Alberta uh, regulations with some, um, some improvements, and, but, but some differences. Um, a few things that I would know from a practical perspective, so if you don't like, this isn't your core uh, remit, um, but you are involved in contract negotiation where um, a supplier might be responsible for data, some of the things that you want to consider, some of the things you'll want to do are look very carefully at the breach logging provisions um, requiring, uh, it is a matter, it is an offense not to do so. Um, requiring you to log all um, breaches of security safeguards and be very attuned when you're negotiating those provisions because it's not just the it's not just the obligation isn't just to log the breaches of the safeguards you actually have in place it's to log the breaches of uh, the breaches or the, the losses of uh, data and um, unauthorized access that have occurred because you failed to put in appropriate safeguards. So um, if you're negotiating a contract and the, and the vendor says, uh, yeah, we'll report to you if the, uh, the security safeguards that we've promised to give you under this agreement uh, are breached, um, you might want to look at that carefully and say, well, is that, is that sufficient? Do I need more than that? Do I need a broader um, uh, uh, breach uh, notification right, a breach reporting right. The other thing to, to notice, of course, is that it's, the obligation falls on the entity that has control over the data, so you do need to think about who has control. Is it a situation of joint control because they have so much, so much um, power over the, to, over the security arrangements for the data, or are they simply following your instructions and you're fully in control? Um, so, Thinking about that, so who 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 does the breach logging um, obligation fall on? Then you'll want to, if you're negotiating those provisions, I mean, from a practical perspective, you're going to want to look to see what is it that you need to log. So, um, unfortunately, the regulations are a bit short on detail. The regulations say you need to 
log as much information as would be necessary to allow the Office of the Privacy Commissioner to audit you and determine whether or not you're in compliance with the breach notification and reporting to the OPC rules, which isn't that helpful. But there are some things that you know you would need to put into a report to the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, and those are at least a starting point. You'll know that you at least need to log that information. So has your service provider agreed to provide you with that information so that you could log it if you're the entity that's in control? That would be a question that you'd want to deal with. In terms of contracting, the timing to report breaches poses, I think, an interesting challenge because with the GDPR, I think they're proposing 72 hours. And so when I think about a contracting chain when you're a prime and you have subcontractors and you're trying to think about breach reporting because typically a notification of some kind is negotiated and one side wants the ever eternal vague in due course. But the challenge is real in the sense that depending upon when you get notified internally as to a breach, then how does that trickle out into your contracts and what obligations have you signed yourself up for? Sometimes you see immediate reporting obligations under a contract, which for obvious reasons poses certain challenges. So I'm curious as to... So with all of these obligations, you need to be able to flow them down through everyone in the chain. So chances are if you're using a cloud-based service, there's more than one person in the chain. If it's a software service, there may be more than one person in the chain. And so those obligations need to flow all the way down. And if you were under the GDPR and you had a 72-hour reporting requirement, that means the lowest person in the chain who may have had the incident needs to be able to make sure that the information gets up to you and that you can get it out to a regulator in time to meet that obligation. So careful attention will need to be paid to how those obligations flow down and whether everyone in that chain is collecting and going to report up the information that you need in order to fulfill your contractual obligations. I'm also interested on the technology side in terms of data breaches from your perspective, Ron, and what's like the kinds of things that happen behind the scenes in terms of the technologies that are there to manage data spills and data breaches and the kinds of things that we can consider because it's a multi-layered system, obviously. Yeah, definitely multi-layered. Most IT teams have a lot of their attention garnered by the business because the business always wants to change applications, make them better and quicker and faster for their services that they're providing to whoever they provide services to. And the complexity of those applications is actually pretty significant and they're getting more and more as technology gets more advanced and the demands on the services of the companies that provide those services are actually getting higher and higher. But then when conversations such as this start to come up, it's not just about adding encryption to data. It's more complicated than that. And it's broken down into a practice that IT has now started to come up with that talks about the preparedness and the ability to be prepared and then the ability to sense that there was a breach and then respond to that breach and then the ability to actually repair and restore the system because, of course, after a breach, the business wants to make sure that the dollars still keep going and the system still keep running. So I'm not saying it causes a lot of anxiety with IT, but it does add a very complex dimension to what's being asked of IT to do because you can't just simply on a whim say, well, we've got to report this in 72 hours. Let's do it. That has a significant amount of preparation that needs to be done in advance. And it's not just simply preparation of people and processes, but it's preparation of the data systems and the application systems to be able to detect but also to create those reports on such a time span. So I think a lot of time needs to be spent with IT to make sure that they understand not only just the gravity of the situation but also the gravity of the complexity of what these systems need to do to be able to respond in such a period of time. And that's where a lot of the complexity gets involved. It's not necessarily about technology as well because in these cases, you can get a false sense of security to make sure the technology is in place. But there was a famous cryptologist that said that if you get comfortable that security will be taken care of by technology, 
then he said that you really don't understand security and technology. Um, and that's why uh, governance becomes such an important aspect of this, and it introduces the right conversation at the right time with the right people when the business wants to modify and change applications because then it brings these concepts back into play about, well, what if there's a breach and how can we report? And, and how do we do that kind of stuff? And the, um, uh, the, the, it really starts to fall more on people and process um, about governance where you incorporate uh, compliance, visibility, and, and accountability in the system and in the people and in the structure, not just simply uh, in the technology. Um, so for IT, it's, this is a very big um, topic, and it's, and it's something that sometimes even dwarfs uh, some of the demands that are given to them by the business in creating new applications and supporting applications and the services that they support. So proper escalations and proper full governance channels. model, right, right down, yeah. right from the top of the house, uh, because uh, as we all know, it it can impact significantly not only just the the brand of the organization, but um, the ability for the organization to survive. And it's not just the breach requirements uh, that have a 72-hour obligation. We also think about the type of data that we're holding. We hold healthcare data. Yeah. And so healthcare has a completely different type of privacy requirement, not only in Canada, but around the world. So, um, you know, your breach requirement might be 72 hours for, for Canadian organizations, but HIPAA requires a 24-hour notification period. Plus, we've got pharma companies coming with coming to us saying, you need to tell us in 24 hours so we can tell our further clients what's happened and, and why it's happened the way it has. So there there are a lot more um, unknowns when it comes to healthcare data as well. And the complexity also for IT comes in the fact that uh, even sensing the breach is difficult because in cybersecurity events, the whole intent is to breach the system through its ways in which you're not intended to attend. So where do you set the triggers and how do you find out whether you can actually sense the breach in time? Um, and the complexity gets involved, right? So in terms of um, attacks and thrusts, external and internal, because they don't necessarily come externally, um, a colleague of mine once fell victim to ransomware, a ransomware attack, which was disguised as a security update. It was totally innocuous. It was the pop-up that comes in the screen. And uh, he clicked the update, and, of course, it locked out his his hard drive and said, now you have to pay me for this. Thankfully, the IT company was able to fix the issue and grab the backed-up files. Um, but time is money, and some companies haven't been as lucky of late and have had their backups back up locked out as well. Um, and apparently one Canadian company allegedly paid $450,000 in Bitcoin, uh, which I find interesting, um, to get its uh, data released. So what do you do? What do you do if it's an inside job? Um, how do you safeguard your security? Do law firms pick up the slack? Um, do law firms pick up the slack? Um, <laughs> You're the insurance policy. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I mean, ransomware is an interesting one because it really it brings it it um, brings things to a head very quickly in as to whether or not the organization has a mature governance model or not, right? So you should know in advance what your what 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 the what the um, guardrails are for for whether you're going to pay a ransom in order to um, get your data back um, because you'll have thought about. Where are the crown jewels? What are the things that I can't live without? Uh, what's my philosophy in terms of paying a criminal to unlock my data as an organization? How am I going to explain that to the public um, or my customers? Um, uh, was there maybe an appropriate backup that I can avoid this because I can um, go back to a point in time? Maybe I've only lost um, hours worth of, of data. All of those things should already have been thought through as part of your cybersecurity strategy um, and, and, and actually walked through as an exercise, a tabletop exercise. So um, if you're in a situation where you're now asking those questions for the first time, then it kind of, I think it demonstrates that you have a failure um, already of your cybersecurity strategy. Um, so, uh, and, and no law firm can really help you at that point. Um, because it's, it's a little bit too late. Um, we can only advise now on what the risks are, but you're likely to be already the the next 
uh, poster child on the uh, talking circuit about what not to do. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I'm just going to, I think this ties in uh, with the last conversation as well, because to me that's the big difference between if you're just talking about a, if you're talking about a data breach as opposed to ransomware. Ransomware, as you said, is just a really obvious data breach, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, okay, no questions. This is a breach. What did they get? What do we do about it? Um, whereas I find it in, in other cases, um, at least when I'm, you know, talking with the data protection officers around the globe for our organization, the, the first question is, is this, you know, how to define a, a data breach? Um, because there's very different views on that. You know, kind of what's that threshold? And you say, okay, there's been a breach. Um, now, you know, what what data has been breached? Is is it personal information? Has personal information been compromised at all, or is it something else that's maybe less sensitive? Um, and then, as you said, dust off the contracts, see if there are <laughs> obligations there, which is going to take some time potentially, unless you have that all laid out clearly in terms of what your, your contractual obligations are. Um, one of the things that I've actually seen as well in in contracts, just sorry, I'm going off a little slightly on topic, but from the last conversation, um, was when you have the notification obligation, I've um, found that some organizations uh, try to limit the notification to situations where their data was compromised. Right, so for example, right, the, the, instead of just saying if you if you know my third party provider has a breach, they may not, you know, they may not have to tell me any time that they have a data breach. But if my data may have been compromised, then they have to tell me, and that could make that, that that's an, again another nuance that you have to track. Um, but as far as ransomware goes, yeah, I, I think it's just one of those ones where you're like, oh, well, this is it. <laughs> you know, put put the plan into action, and if you don't have a plan. Uh, that you, you, what are you going to do? Well, to your point about uh, the different definitions, certainly I remember being advised that a data breach was somebody coming into the system, whereas we talked about data spills as being information that went out of out of our environment. Um, and it also depends on whether it's a laptop that's been stolen because somebody was in a bar and forgot it, or you know whether somebody's actually hacked into the system and done something nefarious internally or externally. Yeah. Or a voter database that's just put on some digital shelf somewhere. Um, and I, I, you know, a lot of this stuff, again, uh, you know, although I'm daily involved with technology, uh, everything that's being discussed today is more, to my mind, about people process and governance uh, because it's about the people who do the things in their daily basis, right? Um, and that's usually how ransomware kind of gets involved because most organizations have uh, security measures in place to prevent ransomware from getting in through malware attacks or uh, inadvertent downloads of software. But so many organizations have so much pressure on their people to do their daily job. And if they can find a way to actually get their job done, they'll get it done. Um, and that's where governance comes in place because one of the things that's really important is to educate uh, the people that use the technology, not construct or build or support the technology, but the ones who use it. Uh, because in some cases, someone would download something off the Internet just to get something done for a client or even for themselves, not understanding what they've just downloaded um, as otherwise uh, a nefarious uh, piece of software. Um, and it's the education, not just the fact that they shouldn't be doing it, but why they shouldn't be doing it and the consequence that shouldn't be, they shouldn't be doing it. And again, it's unrelated to technology. It's just more about those who use the technology and making sure the education is in place. And in my, my experience, that's where organizations tend to go to help them defend against things like ransomware, is not necessarily focusing on the technology, but focusing on the people and the training and the governance models that they have in place to prevent events like that from even occurring. I'm not even sure we know what all of the various risks are, not just ransomware, but surveillance and key logging. Key yeah, exactly. And, it's, uh, and it happens often. And sometimes it's, it happens uh, often without even sensing it for a long period of time, simply because people are inadvertently uh, uh, calling these things into the system. And, and even when you're dealing with some people who are relatively sophisticated with the technology, it doesn't matter how many walls you put up that are uh, supported by secure technology itself, people will find a way around it. Um, and, uh, you know, you can lock up all the USB key slots on a, on a MacBook, but, you know, all the guy has to do is flip on the AirDrop 
and immediately you can start to share files amongst the people in the whole network. In fact, maybe even people on the uh, local transit that they're sitting on might even be able to get into the system. So um, it's very difficult to control the technology day to day because it changes so quick and fast, but it's, it's easier in my mind to really manage the perceptions of the people who actually use the technologies and really help them understand the impact of their actions. Because um, in many cases that I read about where ransomware is becoming a major issue, it was because individuals were actually not following the, following the policies in which the organizations put in place. Just, sorry, go ahead, please. The ACC did a study last year, and I think it said 75% of um, data breaches are by employees. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, the things that we do is employees get trained on their first day of how important the data they have that they hold on their laptop is, how important it is to not log on to a public Wi-Fi network, for example, and how important it is not to download anything on a public computer because they have access to user lists and tools um, that they would otherwise um, be compromising the entire network for. So I think employee training is going to be your best line of defense. So do you have ongoing training with, within your organization? I saw a question, if you could just hold on to it for two minutes. So ongoing training mm -hmm. is, is difficult when you have an organization of about 50 people. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we are, we're always constantly in flux, um, changing. We were 16 people two years ago to 50 people. So ongoing training is, is really developing the training for the first time over the last three years. But what we do is every week we present one of the risk factors at our morning meetings so that everyone in the company has an idea of what's going on. Interesting. And large, larger, larger organizations also have a routine of making sure that people are doing compliance training yearly and other aspects to it. And, and, and that's always matured a little bit more based on the knowledge and the experience that they have in the marketplace. But it's interesting, though, that, you know, when, I, when we were talking about security 15 years ago, in my experience, it was always about the external threats. But now 80% um, of the conversation is about the internal threats, <laughs> which is uh, interesting. So, Julie, maybe you want to comment. We've sort of moved our topic list around a little bit. Um, and we've sort of moved into um, the, sort of the compliance uh, side of it and the importance of communicating compliance. Um, did you want to talk about buy-in and how you deal with it at the executive level? And Thank you. Well, I find that it's become easier and easier with all of the examples of <laughs> The fallout, the reputational fallout from uh, breaches. Uh, I mean, even on the way here in the car, I heard on the news that uh, the CEO of Aquifax had retired this morning. 57. 57 years old, although he did make $4 million last year. I think he's okay. Um, but, I mean, with more and more of these types of things making the news and um, you know, as, as we all know, if we're going to be honest about it, especially if you work for a, private, a public company, what the executives are concerned about, and rightfully so, is shareholder value and stock price. And these are the types of things that will put that in the toilet really quickly. So I find even in the last five years, it's been much easier uh, when I'm communicating with executives both here and outside of Canada um, they understand that this is an issue, and they are happy if I'm offering to train um, em employees or weigh in on things and speak, uh, work more closely with IT and security, for example. They're happy for me to do that. Um, that that's, that's what I've found now. Um, it used to be a little more difficult to get the time or if you, you know, if you went to, say, a, you know, a senior leadership meeting and did a PowerPoint presentation on, on some of these issues and some of these concerns, there used to be less questions asked. Now there's a lot more questions uh, asked. Um, but when you're dealing with a, a global company, as I, I discussed, um, I think the, the, the thing that's sometimes still very difficult to explain, um, especially when I'm speaking with my, global, my U.S. colleagues, is just the differences um, in Canada in terms of privacy laws and expectations mm -hmm. of um, Canadians versus the U.S. They just, they are different, and, and it requires explanation not only once, but on an ongoing basis. Sorry. I, I think for us, it's, 
it's more of a financial and reputational risk over a legal risk any day of the week. So when you're when you're a startup and you're you're 50 people, you want to make sure that your reputation is solid so that you will have the big pharma companies coming to you for for their big uh, marketing deals. So in terms of reputation, our reputation is what we ride on. We can't have a reputation of a company that has breaches. And so with that, when you go to the C-suite, everybody's re- ready and willing to listen and ready and willing to create policy and procedure around data. Um, sorry, there was a question here. I, we, just to keep people engaged and going. Uh, I would be interested, I'd be interested in both the experience of people in the room and the panel as to whether the appropriate response to a ransomware attack is to pay the ransom. <laughs> well, let's, why, why don't we pull the room first? We'll pull the room first. Uh, so a ransomware, a ransomware um, uh, it, it's, it, you're, let's say you're a, a lawyer, sole practitioner, and there's a ransomware attack on you. All of your client files have been locked up, and the amount of money that is being sought from you to unlock your files is the equivalent of $2,500. Do you pay it? Who would pay it? Yeah. And the rest of you would not pay it or you don't know? Depends. So interestingly, in the instance where my colleague had the issue with the ransomware, the backup and recovery was baked into the contract with his IT service provider, so he didn't have to pay anything. So I think that's where the it depends comes in, right? So if you could, if it, if it meant that you're going to be down for three days a week to try to kind of bring things back, you might have lost a, a bit of, of data, maybe maybe you would not pay it. Um, but I think there are many organizations and, and there certainly would be many people in that very instance that I, uh, that I uh, just mentioned who, who would pay it, um, including apparently on the advice of a Canadian Law Society in an actual instance. I think in uh, some many organizations, really even in a way, should have a disaster recovery program in place, um, and that would probably allow you to circumvent some of the challenges that ransomware would probably grant you. Um, and I couldn't coach anybody about whether they should or shouldn't pay it, but if you do pay it, you should figure out that you actually just bought yourself a pretty significant course, and you should learn your lesson. <laughs> should we... Are there other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, You mentioned the difference between breach of spill, and I'm just curious from an act standpoint, does the act treat treat them differently from a reporting standpoint? Uh, It depends. That's such a great answer. Um, I think it partly depends what your contractual obligations are. If your contract is more, con- it, you have to do an analysis as to what kind of data was actually impacted. If there was none, then you may not. It may not matter whether it was a spill or because somebody lost their laptop or somebody hacked in. So you have to look at your contract to figure out what you're actually reporting on. Um, and it so, depends. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, that's great. I should. Maybe I'll be a little more. Uh, I'll ask my question um, very specifically. If your data is masked or encrypted or something like that, do you have the same um, obligation from a reporting standpoint, even though whoever has breached doesn't, doesn't, you know, have anything usable? Well, from a contractual standpoint, there may be one answer, but I think your mic's off. Um, but certainly from the statutory perspective, it. Yeah, it, it so it, it depends actually on the country, right? So, uh, and and what, how the breach law has been um, has been drafted. So some U.S. state laws allow for an encryption safe harbor. So if the data was encrypted and the encryption key wasn't lost with the data, um, and, and then um, then there isn't a breach reporting obli- mm-hmm. obligation. Um, there was lots, many. There were many organizations in Canada while the um, breach reporting regulations were being drafted who were arguing that there should be similar types of safe harbors in Canada, that the federal legislation shouldn't require um, 
breach um, reporting to the commissioner or notification to individuals if data was encrypted and the encryption key wasn't lost, if um, it was basic contact information, um, you know, let's not even uh, quarrel as to whether or not there's a real risk of significant harm, which is a part of the test. Um, there would be certain um, areas where you wouldn't have to uh, even kind of consider whether you needed to uh, report. That was all rejected um, in, 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 by the government, not put into the draft regulations. And so in Canada, you start from the position that the privacy commissioners don't treat encryption as transforming the data into something that isn't still personal information. So they'll look at encryption as a factor as to whether or not there's been a, there's a real risk of significant harm to an individual, but it's not the end of the analysis. So there's no safe harbor. You need to think about the level of encryption, what type of data it was, whether it was a malicious attack or a spill, um, in, in order to, to determine that. Um, uh, so, uh, and there's also no um, kind of out if it's just because it's just a name and an address um, or an email, but no password. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean you're outside of the legislation. But at least federally, you still engage in an analysis of whether there's a real risk of significant harm to an individual as a result of the breach before you have to go to the privacy commissioner or to the individual. That's not the same, though, if it's health data. So if it's health data, the mere fact that it was accessed, it doesn't, you don't get into a real risk of significant harm analysis. It's kind of deemed to be risky, and so you have to you have to you have to report in in most um, in any of the Canadian um, private uh, personal health information statutes that have a data breach reporting requirement. Again, that's not the same around the world. So you do have to you have to look at actually each law on its own and make a determination, and that can be very complex if you um, if you uh, if you uh, are operating in many jurisdictions because these laws are consumer protection laws and so they have extraterritorial effects. They apply where that, where you're doing, with, where you're doing business with that customer. So if I'm selling into California, I'm targeting California residents, I'm selling things to, to, to residents of California, I actually have to pay attention both to the California breach reporting law and, and the, and the Canadian um, breach reporting law make sure that I'm complying with my, my legal obligations. Does anybody else have questions? We can keep going with questions. If uh, I saw some arms at the back, I thought, but I don't have my glasses on. No? Um, one of the things we were going to talk about was actually the right to be forgotten, um, which I maybe partially leads into this. Um, and uh, there's been a fair bit of discussion uh, around the case, uh, the Globe 24 case. Um, and let me just flip to my notes here. Um, so we were, I was going to ask him to sort of give us a brief overview and remind us what it's about and about this case in particular and any of the, uh, um, how to set expectations, what systems should be in place. We can sort of talk about it as a panel, but maybe you'd like to introduce it with just the case. Which is just a foil because the case is yeah. is, is is a little bit um, unique and it, it had no opposition. So David Fraser, um, uh, who con who's written a very good comment on this case, uh, keeps warning people off of um, uh, off of drawing too many conclusions from it. But what happened in um, Globe 24 is that for the uh, for lawyers, um, you familiar with Can Lee and other publicly accessible um, databases of, of, of judicial decisions or tribunal decisions, what was happening, those, those um, sites often um, are not indexed. So if you typed in, you know, Tim Banks um, in Google, you wouldn't come up with a decision that Tim Banks was, uh, was the, the litigant. Um, but if you went to Ken Lee and typed in Tim Banks, you'd find all the decisions that Tim Banks was a, was a litigant. Um, what, uh, what Globe 24H did was um, scrape those decisions, um, then put them on uh, their own website, um, and then, um, and then uh, allow them to be indexed. 
and then sold advertising and then uh, charged people to have decisions with embarrassing facts about them taken down. Um, and this led to um, uh, an, a cross-border investigation, but also led to a privacy complaint and ultimately to a federal court case to get an order requiring uh, Globe 24H to cease doing that. In the context of that, some people have taken that uh, so the, the the issue there was that this was a collection and use of uh, personal information without consent, and that the failure, the, the refusal to take down the information, um, was a violation of uh, 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 of individual privacy rights under Canadian law. Um, some people have tried to argue that that has created a kind of right to be forgotten in Canada, but I think. Um, David Fraser's right about not being too quick to draw that conclusion. That said, it is correct that there is um, a, 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 there is uh, uh, um, a principle that um, people can withdraw consent to the collection, use, and disclosure of their personal information, and another principle that you're only um, permitted to keep that information for as long as is required to provide the services. Um, to the individual or for as long as um, uh, to fulfill the purposes for which it was originally collected, which might also include compliance with laws. So, um, you know, the, the, the example that is bothering many people um, in, the, in the online world came to a head in, in the Ashley Madison decision, which is um, uh, if I sign up for one of your services online. I create a user account, um, password. I use, I use the, the account. Uh, agree to your terms of service. And then I go away. At what point, at what point should you get rid of the data? If I don't come back to your, if I use your site for six months and I never come back, um, for a month, do you still have a legitimate basis to keep the information? How, what if it's what if it's six months? What if it's two years, six years? What's the point at which you no longer have a legitimate reason to keep that information, um, and uh, and should be getting rid of it proactively? Uh, or let's say I come back to you and I want you to um, get rid of it all. Is is it an answer to say it will destabilize my data tables in my database that weren't actually designed to allow you to take out a piece of information here and to take out a piece of information there? Um, can I say no? Um, is that a legitimate basis, or do I actually have to figure out a way to get rid of all of this information? I think a lot of organizations build their technology to capture um, data, but don't spend a lot of time um, thinking about how you get rid of it. Um, unless you're really core into this business, I'm sure that in the healthcare field that is definitely a thought, but um, but that's not the case for a lot of companies. So we definitely built that in into our, our engineering and into our code so that you can remove any images that someone um, has put up, any, any name, uh, password, whatever else, that their personal personal health information and personal information that they might use the app for. We've built-in systems to have that removed. What, what we always question is whether on the side of AWS, for example, they are then removing everything and every, every piece of our content. So that's what we uh, struggle with. Because they're your, they're your host. So, so, so you, there's layers of people, in this case only two, but in some organizations there may be many layers um, in the in the onion uh, of where the data might be. That's right, and then there are backups of backups on another host, of course. So um, you're looking at making sure that it's getting deleted from every different area that it's being stored in, which I think that's more challenging than the taking the pieces of data out one at a time. Mostly because data never sits in one spot, right? Um, and in fact, there's in most organizations, including some of the large banks and insurance companies, that, you know, that are retailers across Canada, uh, they've got operational data stores, which you could probably go into. But you're right. Uh, how do you go back into an encrypted block of archives from three years ago and and poke out ten banks, right? Um, and because those systems aren't necessarily designed for that. 
Uh, so you have to unpack the block, unencrypt it, put on a system. It, no one's really, you know, really thought about that until it's a challenging moment. The thing, too, is um, after the operational data stores and their backups, there's also data warehouses that aggregate the data for processing and reporting. Um, so it's not trivial when someone wants to uh, exercise their right to be forgotten uh, in the IT world. It's very difficult. And building applications for the capability of coping with that makes them very complex. Well, in fact, even in our contracts, they often say, you know, if this contract is terminated, all of the data gets wiped. And, you know, you sometimes see those gener that generic language, which actually has serious consequences because can you actually be forgotten and can you really erase all of that data, you know, except maybe for a carved out purpose of, for legal purposes or however they get carved up. But often I see, I used to see provisions that would be very generic without really contemplation of what the impact was. Uh, I, I know that, I mean, one thing that organizations have been doing and tend to do pretty well, but I don't necessarily think would help with this scenario is with, you know, through the use of document retention policies mm -hmm. where, you know, based on the type of document you have, that's how long you have to keep it for and then you need to destroy it. And that, again, heavily relies on people actually following yeah. the document retention policy, knowing about it, number one, following it, number two, um, but that's focused on a document, not an individual discrete piece of data. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I agree that in most cases, I don't even know how you, well, I don't even know where you would start with, with those types of requests to pull aside from the healthcare industry, um, to, to pull every piece of information you have on a particular individual at their request. We used to joke about this, but John and uh, John, Ron and I were literally talking about um, taking the hard drives out of computers and smashing them. And uh, you know, it, it sounds like a joke, but in fact, some organizations do in fact do that because you don't want to recycle your hard drives, and data can be resurfaced in one way or another if you're clever enough at it. And so, some of them you just literally destroy them to make sure that that data is gone off the hard drive. And with airports now pinching people's hard drives, I don't know. What do you do? Are there any c c questions yeah. that might go to like practical points that we could share our experience and mm -hmm. how we might handle things, whether on these topics or other ways of future proofing? Or any questions at all? That, yeah. yeah, please. So just getting back to this right to be forgotten business, I am more and more frequently vexed by situations where I cannot pay cash for something and I'm being forced to use a payment card. And so really I have no realistic uh, mechanism for opting out of being tracked. Um, can you just comment on the principles involved in that? Um, so, so um, in part, um, you want to think about the fact that not all payment um, mechanisms are the same. And so, um, each uh, uh, the, the Office of the Privacy Commissioner, about a year or so ago, uh, issued a, a nice little guide for um, consumers on on payment mechanisms and different things that people should look for and think about when choosing a payment mechanism that they want to use. Um, ultimately, the person who's providing you with the payment mechanism, the, if it's a credit card, the credit card um, provider, or if it's another uh, mechanism, ultimately the, 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 they're going to have to know where you um, engaged in your transaction. But um, different uh, different uh, payment mechanism types may shield information from uh, others within the chain. So um, to take one that, that I understand a little bit about um, uh, would be Apple Pay. So if, if, I, if I use Apple Pay um, in, in the store, um, in fact, the merchant isn't getting very much information at all about me when I use that. Um, that. And, uh, and, and actually the way it's set up, neither is Apple. Um, and so you can look at these payment types, and some of them actually do um, 
uh, bring greater privacy to, to, uh, to the transaction than you would otherwise have. I will make a plug, though, for the, for the merchants and, and others in the, in the chain. I think sometimes we forget that um, a, there, these systems involve a very large investment. And so, to some extent, we all have to, as consumers, citizens, kind of figure out where the right balance is between allowing kind of a certain degree of monetization. Anybody who works in sales knows how difficult it is to make a sale and also the cost of sales, the cost of acquisition of a customer and the maintenance of a customer. And so a lot of that data collection and use is, is designed in order to really understand that customer better in order to, um, in order to retain that customer. So um, there's kind of those two flip sides, and I, I think that we're still kind of navigating our way through that. We see from the Privacy Commissioner um, of Canada a real emphasis on um, payment. So if I paid you for a service, I should have the ability for you to say, no, stop tracking me for these secondary purposes. Whereas if I'm getting a free service from you, then, okay, fine. I recognize that I'm part of the value exchange and you're going to use, use data because you've made an investment. But I think we need to watch that. And if, if you're internally developing a governance structure, you want to include a privacy impact assessment for all of these products and services in order to evaluate them um, in terms of their privacy intrusiveness and um, where as an organization you think that fits given your, your kind of how you, pre how you present yourself to consumers. Um, is this in keeping with your business philosophy? Thanks. Not exactly relating to this um, unit, but if I can ask anything. Um, it's more of a technology question, Ron, closer to one of the points you mentioned before about the laptop and the USB drives being killed in the air, dropped, et cetera. Um, how much are we taking for granted systems that we use in everyday work that are designed to create security safeguards, like VPN? Is it possible to hack into a network like that or other like technologies that we rely on? Sorry, let me just understand your question. With VPNs, uh, are you concerned that they're hackable? And that they, you, yeah. You, yeah. It's just one example. Um, uh, are they, is the VPN itself a ta a, a hackable? I, I think all technologies could be argued as hackable. Um, you know, just like the arms war and defense, you know, by the time someone's got a defense for the latest weapon, uh, the newest weapon that can actually overcome it, and, and unfortunately, it's the same thing in technology. Um, so I would probably argue that somehow it would be hackable. But that's, well, you know, a VPN really is just an encrypted pipe between something and something else so that that way those in between the pipe can't really see what's going on in the pipe. Huh. Um, the bigger issue that most organizations have with VPNs is uh, what the pipe allows you to do, right? So if, you, uh, if you're using a VPN that connects two different networks, it's not the issue of can you intrude into the actual pipe through the Internet or in, when you're in a hotel and you've logged on to their Wi-Fi and trying to get access to your, um, uh, let's say, to your corporate system. The question also is, as well, you know, maybe someone in the hotel can't see that pipe that goes between your computer and your corporate system, but what if they get access to your computer? Uh, then actually you've given them a pipe right into your corporate system. So it's not necessarily the issue about is the VPN hackable. It's the question about what does the VPN give access to somebody who actually has access to your computer. So, and that's a bigger challenge for most organizations as well. Um, and that's why, again, policies and procedures about you know what systems you do have on your computer, and and um, you know policies and procedures about using VPNs. There are some companies that have multiple people uh, working for them who have access to multiple VPNs at the same time. And again, policies and procedures not running both VPNs because you'd be connecting your client and then also your corporate system to the same connections. Um, inadvertently not knowing really that even though you're making your life easier, um, to, that you're actually exposing your corporation. Other questions? On the floor, yeah. 
So I was wondering if there is any statutory framework. Can you speak loud into the mic, please? I was wondering if there is any statutory framework for the prosecution of um, perpetrators of ransomware if they ever get apprehended. Sorry, it was statutory framework? For the prosecution. Prosecution of ransomware. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, yeah the criminal code. Um, there are provisions in the criminal code that 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 uh, that would apply um, to to um, to uh, the deployment of ransomware um, on, on a system. So uh, as, as well as really any unauthorized in, any unauthorized intrusion um, or or um, manipulation of data. Um, so they they, they could be uh, used, uh, assuming that you could. Um, uh, uh, catch the perpetrator, which is the challenge. Ramel, did we have any questions online? Okay. And we can well, great. Well, we're, yeah, we can we're, 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 we'll stick around for a little longer if, if you have anything else you'd like to, to ask and didn't want to ask in public. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just on behalf of the TCLG, LexisNexis, and Dentons, we just want to thank the panel for um, giving us a very engaging talk. Uh, we also want to say thank you to Rommel, Rommel uh, Salvador for being back person and behind the scenes person setting this all up. Um, so thank you very much. We have a small token of appreciation for you here. And um, a shameless plug for the TCLG. We do have some upcoming events. Um, just check up on our website to, to get some details on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>